Let's begin today in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 28, where we continue with the list of people groups or nations that Jeremiah warns are still going to come under the judgment of God at the hands of the Babylonians. Uh, Some of these nations living near to Judea thought that they should celebrate the fall of the Judean kingdom. But now they're being told the same fate awaits them because of their sin. So now we're going to look at a group of Bedouins, a Bedouin kingdom, that apparently was located to the east of Ammon and Moab and Edom, all of which, and Damascus, by the way, all of which we kind of looked at uh, yesterday. It's the kingdom of Kedar or Hatzor, and this is what the prophecy says. Concerning Kedar and the kingdoms of Hatzor that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, struck down, thus says he who is, rise up, advance against Kedar, destroy the people of the east. So God's command to the Babylonians is take these guys out. Their tents and their flocks shall be taken, their curtains and all their goods. So they're Bedouins, and that's part of their property. Their camels shall be led away from them, and men shall cry to them, Terror on every side! And here is what God tells them they're going to have to do. Verse 30, Flee, wander far away, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Hatzor, declares he who is. Now, the depths there might, in fact, be the reference that we've seen before of the place of the dead, the pit, uh, the, uh, the depths of the earth. So, this might be a reference to them dying. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has made a plan against you and formed a purpose against you. Rise up, Advance against a nation at ease that dwells securely, declares he who is, that has no gates or bars, that dwells alone. So take out these Bedouins. They don't really have these fortified cities. Instead, they are wanderers. Their camels shall become plunder, their herds of livestock a spoil. I will scatter to every wind those who cut the corners of their hair, and I will bring their calamity from every side of them. Now, cutting the corners of the hair is a reference to a pagan worship practice. It was somehow also related to ancestor worship, uh, where you would shave the sideburns completely off. I mean, from the temple, down past the ear, down into the mutton chop area of a beard. And the Israelis had been told in the Mosaic Law they were to never do that because it was a pagan practice. Uh, Now, uh, modern-day Hasidic Jews have taken that rule, and they never cut that portion of their head's hair. And so they end up with the little curly cues that uh, come down uh, at the sides of their beards. Uh, But anyway, the thing here is these Bedouins practiced that that worship uh, shaving of the side of the head. Verse 33, Hatzor shall become a haunt of jackals, an everlasting waste. No man shall dwell there, no man shall sojourn in her. Now, we don't know exactly where this hot sore is supposed to be located. It's not the one that's in Israel proper. Uh, it's somewhere to the east, uh, somewhere over probably in Saudi Arabia or Jordan. But it's so desolate, we don't even know where it's at. Let's now shift over to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 25, to be precise, where we'll find other warnings of judgment against the Ammonites. And so I think they may have been produced right around this same time. Ezekiel chapter 25, verse number 1. The word of he who is came to me. 
Son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, hear the word of he who is God. Thus says he who is God, because you said, aha, over my sanctuary when it was profaned and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate and over the house of Judah when they went into exile. So because you were happy about all the bad things that happened to the northern kingdom and now to the southern kingdom. Verse 4, therefore, behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east for a possession, and they shall set up encampments among you and make their dwelling in your midst. So they're going to have a problem with the Bedouins that we were talking about just a little while ago, but also with the coming of the Babylonians. They shall eat your fruit. They shall drink your milk. I will make Rabbah, their main city, a pasture for camels and Ammon, a fold for flocks. And then you will know that I am he who is. For thus says he who is God, because you've clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel. Therefore, behold, I've stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over as plunder to the nations." So because you celebrated by, you know, clapping your hands together, stamping your feet in celebration, uh, now you're going to be the target of judgment. I will cut you off from the peoples and will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am he who is. So very similar prophecies given to Ezekiel as were given to Jeremiah. Verse number eight, thus says he who is God, because Moab and Seir, so two of the others that we've already read judgment passages about in the book of Jeremiah are brought up here. Uh, Moab, the brother nation to Ammon, and Seir, the other name for Edom. Behold, The house of Judah is like all the other nations. So basically, Moab and Edom are saying, Judah is no big deal. It's just another country. Verse number nine, Therefore, I will lay open the flank of Moab for the cities, or from the cities, from its cities on its frontier, the glory of the country, Beth Yeshemoth, Baal Me'on and Kirithayim. I will give it along with the Ammonites to the people of the east as a possession that the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations and I will execute judgments upon Moab and then they will know that I am he who is. So same thing that we saw in Jeremiah. They're pretty much going to have an end to their independent status as a located nation. They'll still exist as a people group, but their territory is going to be taken over by Bedouins uh, after uh, the Babylonians have swept through. Verse number 12, thus says he who is God, because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and has grievously offended in taking vengeance on them. Therefore, thus says he who is God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast, and I will make it desolate. From Timon even to Dadan, they shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, declares he who is God. So again, we've got this whole thing that in the future, the Israelis are going to come down into this region of the Edomites and uh, basically conquer them. Uh, The Edomites, by the way, abandoned this territory to the southeast of the Dead Sea and migrated over into the southern part of Judah. 
And they then were conquered by one of the uh, Hasmonean kings of Judah and uh, were basically annexed into Israel itself, into the Judean kingdom. So all this came to pass in the time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Continuing in verse number 15 with another people group that are warned about what's coming. Thus says he who is God, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never-ending enmity, therefore thus says he who is God. Behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Kirathites, which is a subgroup of the Philistines, and destroy the rest of the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them with, re- with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am he who is when I lay my vengeance upon them. And so they too get broken uh, as a people group. And uh, eventually, uh, that territory also uh, gets absorbed somewhat into the Judean kingdom uh, before the New Testament period uh, arrives on the scene. Now, we are going to talk about an event that we're not exactly sure when it occurred, so I've kind of held it off until after the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, all of the Jews had been moved uh, into uh, their exile places in the Babylonian kingdom. And that is um, a time of of self-centered actions by King Nebuchadnezzar. So turn to the book of Daniel, chapter number 3. Now, keep in mind that Daniel and his three friends that are mentioned in the next story uh, that we're going to tell, uh, they were taken into exile in 605 B.C., when Nebuchadnezzar first came to the throne. The temple was destroyed and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in 587, so couple of decades has passed by uh, with these guys being in exile uh, once the next big group of Jewish exiles were brought into uh, Babylon. And more than likely, either in the beginning of his reign or here after he's conquered so many of the countries of the lower Middle East, Nebuchadnezzar gets full of himself. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, so that's 90 feet, basically, and its breadth, 6 cubits, or 9 feet. Now, proportionally, that is going to be a very skinny statue. It's not going to look right. So more than likely what we're talking about here is a statue-pedestal combo, much like we see in our Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, where I think the statue and the pedestal are both about 150 feet by themselves, so about 300 feet tall together. So I don't know how tall the actual image of Nebuchadnezzar was, but it's sitting on a pretty high pedestal that raises it up uh, in the sight of everybody. So he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So he puts it in a prominent place, uh, probably not very far from the capital city of Babylon. Perhaps it was even located between Babylon City and the place where Ezekiel was living to the southeast, one day's travel uh, from Babylon City. Verse number two. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So he gets everybody that is in leadership to show up for the dedication of this golden statue. Now, I do suspect that no matter when this happens, he's also remembering the dream that God sent him about the statue with the head of gold and the arms and chest of silver and the belly and and, uh, hips uh, of uh, bronze and the legs of iron and feet with iron and clay mixed. Uh, Because he'd been told, you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. And so I wouldn't be a bit surprised if in his egoism, he's decided I need to have a completely golden statue to represent how strong my kingdom is and how it's going to last a good long time. So he sets up this image for worship. And then, and I'm going to avoid some of the repetition of the wording here, then all of those leadership people that had gathered for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Uh, They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So when you hear the musical call to worship, everybody is supposed to bow before this image. And then here comes the warning. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Now, don't think about uh, an incinerator where you throw uh, trash and and uh, things of that nature to burn them completely up. What I want you to think about instead is a large brick kiln. So you've got a great big, perhaps circular, building. It's got a vent hole in the center uh, uh, that goes up to the sky that allows the, the, uh, all of the, uh, the gases that are being... Uh, made by the furnaces that are in the walls around it to escape to the sky. Uh, And there's an interior area where they would put pottery and uh, clay tablets in order to fire them for permanent uh, use. And so there were plenty of these all over Babylon because they, um, they fired a lot of of pottery, and they also fired all of their government documents as clay tablets. So it's an easy thing to use for an execution by heat. Uh, The temperature is going to be probably between 1,800 and 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a pretty serious uh, way to kill, uh, execute someone for not doing what they're told. So, verse 7, as soon as the people heard the sound of all that music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans, uh, Chaldeans is the most ancient term for the area of Babylon. Chaldea itself was upriver from the city of Babylon, probably not very far from Haran, uh, where uh, you had uh, the descendants of Abraham, not, not uh, uh, his, excuse me, his family members, not him, uh, but uh, his uh, brothers are from Haran. So Chaldea is up in that area. And so when it appears here, it's probably just another word for uh, the honored families of the, of the Babylonians. So certain high-placed 
Babylonians, Chaldeans, came forward and they maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of all these musical instruments shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, paid no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. So religious Jews would never have participated in this ceremony because it was an act of worship. These three gentlemen, are, uh, they are singled out because they are in leadership roles, have been since the third year of Nebuchadnezzar, because they and Daniel had been appointed to high positions of leadership by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. Uh, so these guys are complaining these Jew leaders are setting a bad example, and you need to do something about it. Now, you might wonder, where in the world's Daniel? Well, Daniel's probably traveling on state business when all this happened. That's why he's not here. So Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. And so they brought these men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear all of these musical instruments, you fall down and worship the image that I've made. Well and good if you do that. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And so King Nebuchadnezzar is mad that his ego has been challenged like this. And so he tells him, I'm going to give you one more chance because you're important people in leadership. And if you'll just do it, we'll forget all about the fact that you didn't do it before. But if you won't do it now, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace, just like I said. Your status is not going to protect you. In fact, what God is there that can protect you from me? Because I am the great king of kings. Now, I love what these gentlemen said back. And this is really the teachable moment in the whole story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So their response is, yes, there is a God who could deliver us. He is the creator God. We serve him. But even if he chooses for his own purposes not to save us, we're still not going to bow before your image because it's the wrong thing to do. And so that's, that's true faith, is doing what you know is the right thing to do, even when you know it's going to cost you your life. Yes, God could step in. He could intervene. We believe that. But even if he chooses not to, it doesn't change the fact that this would be a wrong thing to do. And that's why these guys are heroes of faith. Well, predictably, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. Expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. So this thing was as hot as it could possibly get. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. They were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. So the guys that threw them in, they were in such a, a place of great heat that their own clothing burst into flame and they died instantly. 
Uh, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they go flying down into the center of this furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose in haste and he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire. They're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. The fourth is looking like one of the divine beings that we know exist. And so he came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. See, nobody could go in and get them. They actually had to walk out. And the shat traps, the prefects, all these leaders, they gathered together and they saw for themselves that the fire had not any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Uh, So cotton, I think, will burst into flame uh, between 100 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Hair will will singe pretty quickly uh, before you get anywhere near uh, that mid-range. These guys didn't smell like fire. And you know, if, you, if you're anywhere near a campfire, you smell like wood smoke for quite some time. So these guys don't even f- smell or look like they've been anywhere near a high heat source. And so Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, his messenger, and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. But his lesson will not be long learned. He will soon fall back into his egoism and forget that there is one God that everyone has to answer to.